stand together as we go to the word of the Lord. I want to go to, uh, believe it or not, I want to go to John 10. And I want to read uh, several verses out of John 10, beginning with verse 26. Brother Cody Frederick, I know, had no idea I was going to go to John 10 today. And uh, it just shows how the Holy Ghost works. And uh, I knew I was listening to the Lord. I'm glad to find out he was listening today. <clears throat> but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, boy, I don't want that to be my report. Do you? You are not of my sheep. Um, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. There's a couple of things I want to point out in this verse. Number one, if you're his sheep, you're going to hear him. Number two... It's not near as important that you know the Lord as it is that He knows you. There's a lot of people that run around talking about how they know the Lord. Well, when I found the Lord, I know the Lord. I'm going to tell you the important thing is that is the Lord knows you. He said, and I know them. And boy, here's the big clincher, and they follow me. It's one thing to know the Lord. It's another thing... For him to know you, and the big question is, are you following? Are you following? Let's read one more verse, verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. God bless you. You can be seated. I want to talk to you this week. This is week six. This is week six of a series, and I want to title this portion what is an overarching, it's an overarching theme, but I'm going to focus more on this word today than usual. I want to talk to you about separation. Today's one word title will be separation. In week one, I covered motives. In week two, I covered sanctification. In week three, I covered convictions. In week four, hunger. Week five was time. And this week is going to be separation. I want to talk to you about being separated. <clears throat> you know, we live in a world that is trying to erase separation. That is the spirit of the Antichrist of our day. Anything Christ and the Bible is for, the world system and the world government will be against it. Okay? So as long as this was a Christian nation, everything kind of flowed together. When Obama got into office, they started talking about a post-Christian nation. Post-Christian nation. What a sad, sad thing. But yet the Bible had been prophesying that it was coming for 2,000 years. A post-Christian nation, society, and world. Now, I have visited a lot of post-Christian countries um, in traveling uh, missionary journeys, I have visited nations who have no Christian values. I know what it feels like to be in that environment, and I could not wait to come home. And now, I'm watching our nation start resembling those countries. When I Went, made my first trip to Brazil in 2002. I can remember coming home from Brazil, and when I got off the plane, I wanted to get down on my knees and kiss the pavement. I was so happy to be back in a nation where everywhere I went, I did not feel evil forces. Because in Brazil, everywhere you go, you feel 
the overwhelming presence of evil, witchcraft, idolatry, uh, open homosexuality, same-sex marriage, um, any, any force that opposes the church or what the church stands for is all around you. I knew because I'd read the Bible that that day was coming for the United States of America, but I never dreamed, I never dreamed that I would face it in just 20 years. That 20 years from that point, it's been 19 years, I believe I'm right about that, if I'm adding it up right, 2002, 2022, it's been 20 years. I never dreamed that 20 years from that moment that I would live in a nation that I would actually feel a greater threat because in Brazil it was not at the forefront. It was underlying. But today in the United States of America these thought processes are militant. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Over there it was an underlying thing that had been accepted for a long time. Here it is militantly being pushed down our throats. And so I want to talk to you for a few minutes today about separation, what separation means, and why separation is necessary. Separation is necessary because separation, listen to me, separation brings peace. It is a lack of separation that brings confusion. I want to say that again. Separation is what brings peace. Lines, clear-cut lines of demarcation is what brings peace. A clear communication and understanding brings peace. A lack of line and demarcation and separation is what brings confusion. Well, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, if, if this world really believed that love was to just let everybody be, and do what they, be what they are and do what they do and there be no lines of demarcation, if they really believed that's what love was, then they would utilize that in every situation. If it's true that there needs to be no, no lines of demarcation, then why won't the Democrats readily accept the Republicans? Why do they separate themselves? Why don't they welcome the Republicans in with open arms, no matter how they identify themselves? And the same true the opposite way. You can't pick and choose who you're going to separate from and who you're not. If, if love is letting everyone identify as they desire to identify, and not allowing there to be any lines of separation, then why would a liberal woman divorce her husband for having a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Why separate him from another lover? Why not accept him the, how, for however, whatever he wants to be? Why draw clear-cut lines of separation? Why would she expect him to cut everyone else off? You see, you can't pick and choose. You can't pick and choose where you're going to separate and where you're not going to separate. You're either going to separate at every area that's important or none at all. And a lack of separation is what brings confusion. The moment you do not separate and differentiate is the moment that confusion ensues. 
And we literally have a, a time in our world where they don't want to separate anything at all. I could not believe, and, and here's, you know, depending on how you feel, depending on how you feel, uh, I'm not wanting to get into a political debate with you right now. I just want you to think with me just a moment. But we had a gold medalist that pulled herself out of, of the competition in uh, the Olympics. Now, whether you think she should or should not have is, is, is not relevant to this conversation. That's not even what I'm going to talk about. What I am going to speak of, though, is the way the reporters handled that. Because what they said was, I really respect you. I respect you more for pulling yourself out than had you won gold. Now, that, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a real touchy subject in our day-to-day -day. because when you no longer respect someone for standing out, you're creating an issue because that's what the Olympics is for, to separate winners from losers to separate people who are willing to pay the price from people who are not willing to pay the price. And so there's a, now a move on in our school systems. There's now a move on in our school systems to dumb down the grading process. To take away, to, to, to take away the harder classes to put everyone on the same even keel to where everyone feels like that they have succeeded. Now, the minute that you do that, the whole, listen, the whole idea is to erase separation, to erase the lines that separate. There is a move on to, to separate to, to, move, to move lines of separation between races, to erase lines of separation between male and female. Anything that separates us, they want to erase those lines of separation because they say that lines of separation is what brings confusion and racism and hatred and anger. I submit to you that it's just the opposite. I submit to you that not recognizing lines of separation is what brings confusion, hatred, anger, and frustration. If they get what they want, no one can no longer take pride in anything that separates them. A man cannot be proud to be a man anymore. A woman cannot be proud to be a woman anymore. You can no longer be proud of your Spanish, Mexican, Italian, European heritage. In fact, for you to even speak of the fact that you come from Ireland or England or Italy or whatever, you're now drawing attention to separation and you're now bringing angst. You're offensive in your speech. You're lifting yourself up above someone else. I'm telling you, God from the beginning taught us that separation was necessary. That lines of demarcation were necessary that it's very, very necessary to separate. The problem with, with separation is not in the separation itself. The problem with separation is when you lift yourself up or beat someone else down because of separation, but not separation 
within itself. Let me ask you, when you take away lines of separation in school, how do you know when you succeeded? How do you know when you've succeeded if you take away lines of separation? If everyone that goes through the class gets an A, that's literally, listen to me, I'm not playing games with you. That's literally where we're headed. If they don't do something, everyone that runs wins a medal. Everyone that sits through most of the classes gets an A. Gets the same grade as everyone else. And the whole reason for this is they listen, they say that math is racist. I'm not joking with you. I'm not playing games. Part of the critical race theory curriculum is that math is racist because only Asians can do it. They found that most of the people that do the higher, level, higher levels of math are Asian, therefore math is racist against all the rest of us that are not Asian. The minute that you start that kind of stupidity and so so here you say why would you teach on this in a church setting of separation listen to me because this has been in the church for a long long time we have racism in the church but it's not it's not racism toward color it's racism to the fact that if you believe that separation from the world is necessary, then you're some kind of a conservative bigot. You're mean and you're harsh and you're cruel because you believe separation is necessary. It's the same spirit, folks. Jesus taught that separation was a necessary part of the church. He began separation from the first time he spoke in the book of Genesis. He separated the sea animals from the land animals. He separated the firmament from the sky and the sky from the ground. He separated the... the, the he separated the planet, water, and land. Are you listening to me? He separated the different kinds of trees. You know, if we're if we're gonna if we're gonna if we're gonna go down the journey of this lack of separation process, then is a person that goes to the grocery store and says, Oh no, I don't want apples, I want oranges. Well, what are you, some kind of vegetable racist? I mean, fruit's fruit. Why are you making a big deal out of it? There's a reason why he separated the fruit trees. And you say, well, you're being ridiculous. I'm really not being ridiculous. I'm being real with you. You either got to separate things or separate nothing. But you can't pick and choose. You can't pick and choose. We're, we're headed to a point that we can't solve a crime. There will be no way to solve a crime. If they keep on with critical race theory and a lack of separation, Brother Bryant, being a policeman's over with. Because if someone breaks into your house while you're not there, robs you, the only way to catch them is a process of separation. Was it a man or was it, oh, you can't do that. I mean, it was a, it was a person. 
Were they black, white, Hispanic? Oh, you, you can't do that. Can't separate that. You're racist. A person broke into your house, and we're not going to identify whether they're man, woman, Mexican, black, white. We're not going to identify any of that because that's all racist. We're just going to say a person, well, well, you can forget it. You'll never catch them. Well, they identify as. Well, who cares? And the same is true in the church. You can't be, listen to me, you can't be a Holy Ghost filled apostolic that identifies worldly. You can't identify with the world and be a tongue talker. You have got to separate yourself. You've got to identify as who you are and what you are. If you want the world, go to the world. If you want the church, be willing to get in the church. Be willing to do whatever it takes to separate yourself. Mm. Hallelujah. 343, I took too long. Man, I'm taking so long with my introductions, I can't get to my message. Jesus said, my sheep will know my voice. I'm going to tell you, the minute that you reach the point that you can't hear his voice is the minute that you're no longer a part of his church. There should be something in you that fails to hunger for things of the world. The Bible instructs you to love not the world. Therefore, here's the deal. If you love the world, then you don't belong to Him. Wanting to be like the world does not mean that you can't be a part of the church because you want to be like the world. It means that because you want to be like the world, you're actually not a part of the church. Your very hunger and lust and desire identifies you. I started to call today life. I started to, to, to identify today's Teaching is life. Let's, let's look at John 15 just a second. I've only got 15 minutes, so I've got to hurry. Let's look at John 15 and 9. John the 15th chapter and the 19th, I'm sorry, John 15 and 19. Could you go there for me? John the 15th chapter. How many of you understand that the confusion of this world is directly related to erasing of separation? And God demands separation. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. I wonder how many of you are different enough that the world knows it. I know Pentecostals that could not be convicted in a court of law for being Pentecostal. There's not enough evidence to convict you. If you were pulled into court for being an apostolic and they used the Bible to judge whether you were apostolic or not, I don't know if they could get enough conviction. You can't only identify as a Pentecostal on service days. You're doing no good if you only look like a Pentecostal when you come to church. You got to be a Pentecostal all day, every day. You got to be an apostolic all the time. 
You've got to be an apostolic morning, noon, and night if you're actually going to be an apostolic. Listen, apostolic is not something you do. Apostolic is what you are. It's what you are. You are an apostolic. You're not doing Pentecost. You, you are Pentecostal. It's not something you put on. It's something that's on the outside that exposes itself on the outside. It's on the inside and it exposes itself. 1 John 2 and 15, while I hurry. 1 John, the second chapter and the 15th verse. I want to tell you separation is necessary. Separation is God's plan. Separation wants you to be separated. God wants you to celebrate the fact that you're different. Come up here, Brother Chris. There's no one in this world that's going to think Chris is my biological son. Come on up here. I mean, as handsome and as good looking as he is, he's still not kin to me. I know you can look at him and say, man, he's so handsome, he's bound to be kin to Brother Copeland. They're both just such good looking fellas. But the deal is, it's very obvious. Even though I'm tall, dark, and handsome also, well, neither one of us are making that tall deal, are we? Even though we're both dark and handsome, he's just a little few shades darker than I am. Now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Instead of everybody pretending that there's no difference in he and I, we should both separate or celebrate what we are. There should be a celebration. He should celebrate his heritage. Whatever it is, wherever he comes from, should be celebrated. I'm thankful. I celebrate my European heritage. For, the ye for years, I celebrated the American Indian heritage. Because I was told I had some. I did a DNA test and hadn't got one ounce. I wept over the trail of tears. I did the war dance and the rain dance and thought about my ancestors and anyway, none. But let me just tell you this. He needs to celebrate his heritage. I need to celebrate my heritage. Where we get into trouble is not recognizing the separation, but if he, if he tries to do anything to diminish what I am because I don't look like him, right. or I do anything to diminish what he is because he does not look like me, that's where we get into trouble. <laughs> we ought to be standing together as brothers in the body of Christ while recognizing that there's an ethnic difference between the two of us. And we celebrate that difference. It's what makes the world great and what makes the world go round. Thank you, brother. The same is true in the church. Let me tell you something. God started this thing with, with, with separation. Brother Chris McGrone, he's going to end it with separation. The last thing that's going to happen, the first thing that happened to open this world is he was separating. The last thing that's going to happen when he closes this thing down, right before he burns it with a fervent heat, is he's going to separate, separate everyone that is a part of his kingdom from those who refuse to be a part of his kingdom. It's all about separation. And here's what he asks you. As soon as you fall in love with me, separate yourself right then. Why? Because when you separate yourself, everyone in your circle of influence is then demanded to make a decision also. It's all about witnessing. And you're not going to win them by not separating yourself. If you wonder why you're not, listen to me, 
When people get full of the Holy Ghost, when they get in the church and get full of the Holy Ghost, right while they're on fire and they really start changing, is when they're going to have their greatest influence for outreach. Isn't that amazing? Somebody said, well, I'm going to try to be like them to win them. It don't work. Why is it that, that when people are making their greatest change, it's when they're the biggest witness? Boy, this mic, I can tell it goes out because y'all, y'all. Somebody said, well, you can't win anybody being so strange and different. Why is Islam the fastest growing religion on the face of the earth? How well you think they fit in? When you get full of the Holy Ghost and you make drastic changes, you demand your circle of influence. To either change with you or separate themselves from you. And you're not going to win your friends or your family or anybody else by trying to get embarrassed and diminish the difference. The greatest way to win them is to be drastically different and not be ashamed of your differences. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. If you're ashamed to separate, it exposes that you have a love issue. There's a love issue if you don't want to separate. And you can't let people, because they feel uncomfortable, make fun of you. You don't allow that. You don't allow that to influence you. What you don't understand is if they do all that, it's because you're making them feel convicted. And you better recognize that conviction and maximize on it and not get embarrassed by it. Don't try to defend yourself. Hold your head up high and say, yes, that's what I believe. Yes, that's what I stand for. And do not let them diminish you because of your difference. That's your only hope. If they can make you hang your head, it takes conviction off them, and that's why they do it. And you ruin your circle of influence. You can be seated. Ephesians 2 and verse 1. Let's look at a few verses here in Ephesians, the first chapter. Ephesians, the first chapter. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. While they're going there, I want to tell you that God wants complete separation. He wants drastic separation. Ephesians 2 and 1. I'm running out of time, so if you can't get there on the computer, I'll have somebody read it. Ephesians, there it is, thank you. And you he hath quickened who were dead... In your trespasses and sins. I started to call this life because here's the deal. Here's the deal. This is what you've got to get a hold of. Everything that's not in Christ is dead. And it's impossible for a dead man to understand things of life. So when people say, well, I just can't understand, Brother Copeland, what you're talking about. I just don't see separation. It's because you're dead to it. It's because you're dead to it. Jesus will explain that later. Let's look at a few verses here because i got to hurry. I'm running out of time. Verse 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in children of disobedience. Not children of sin, children that do not want to be obedient to separation. There's a disobedience even in people that are in the church. They don't want to separate themselves. They want to talk in tongues, lay hands on the sick, see the miracles. They just don't want to change. 
And Isaiah said it this way. Listen, Isaiah prophesied of the last days. And he said, here's what the last days are going to look like. He said, seven women are going to take hold on one man. And here's what they're going to say. They're going to say, we want your name but we want to dress the way we want to dress, eat what we want to eat, live like we want to live. We just want your name. That's what Isaiah said. Isaiah prophesied of the last days, said seven women would take hold on one man and say, we'll dress like we, we, we'll supply our clothing, we'll supply our food, we'll live like we want to live, just give us your name. If that is not a description of the charismatic movement of our day, I don't know what is. We just want your name. We want to be able to work miracles in your name. We want to be able to cast out devils in your name. But we want to live, eat what we want to eat, and dress like we want to dress, and live like we want to live. All we want is your name. Let's look at John chapter 3 right quick. Very important, very important scripture on separation. John chapter 3 and verse 3 through 5. I want you to look at this. These are very familiar scriptures, but I want you to look at them very carefully. John chapter 3, verse 3, and we're going to read through verse 5. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again. I just don't see it like you preach it, preacher. I just, don't see, I just don't see it like Brother Copeland does. Well, you probably won't if you spend all your time on Facebook and Instagram and incarnality. But don't try to tell me what the Bible says when you don't hardly ever read it. You can't see the kingdom of God until a miracle happens to you. And it's a miracle of love and life. Would you say love and life? Love and life. It's a miracle of love and life. When you fall in love with Him and you awake to newness of life, you will see exactly what I'm preaching about separation. Verse 4. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born again when he's old? How can he enter a second time in his mother's womb and be born? Verse 5. Jesus answers again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and spirit. Now he lifts the ante a little bit more. Not only can you see it, but you sure can't inherit or enter something you can't see. All of this comes through revelation. Now let's go to Romans chapter 8. From my last verse of scripture on separation, Let's go to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read about 10 verses right here in one minute. Well, I may go over a little over time, but I'll hurry. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 through 9 or 10. Therefore there is now no condemnation of them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. That's the whole thing. What are you alive to? Are you alive to God or are you alive to this world? You've got to decide which, listen to me, you can't live in both. I've got to say it again. You can't live in both. You've got to die to one and live in the other or live in this one and die to that one. It's like the guy that couldn't decide whether he was going to be a, whether he's going to be a Confederate or a Union soldier, and so he put on Confederate breeches and a, and a Union jacket, and everything went great until the two armies converged on each other, and both of them shot him. You can only play both sides for so long. There's a time, listen, there's a time of separation coming. John 7 describes that separation. In John the 7th chapter, it says, Enter in at the straight gate, for broad is the path, that, it, it, but for narrow is the way that leadeth to life, and broad is the path that leadeth to destruction. Many there be that go in the broad path. He said, And many are going to come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, we had your name. We, it's the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. 
Many are going to come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, we, had our, we cast out devils in your name. We did many wonderful works in your name, but we wanted to dress and live the way we wanted to. And he's going to say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. You had my name, but you did not have my relationship. For the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You've got to choose, folks. Verse 4. And if you don't choose, He's going to choose for you in the last day. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Let me tell you something. You've got to decide whether you want to take God's Word and dress and live and act in such a way that pleases Him or whether you still want to be accepted by this world because that's what it's all about. Which one do you want to please? Which one do you want to make happy? The one that can save you or the one that wants to destroy you? Folks, by now, you ought to be saying, I don't want nothing to do with this world. You ought to be able to see that it's headed for destruction. You ought to be getting off the train. If there's ever a time to get off the world train, you ought to be jumping off right now, saying, I don't care what they think about me. I don't care what they say about me. They're mixed up, and they're all going to Hades anyway. I ain't going with them. Let them make fun of me. Let them hate on me. They sure hadn't got the answer. If there's any hope, it's in Jesus Christ. If there's any hope, it's in the church. I want to be pleasing in His sight. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. That's why you can't give up this world. You want to impress it. For what, to what end? They're going to vaccinate you, mask you, make fun of you, destroy you. And ultimately send you to hell. The only liberty is in the church. The only life hope is in... Well, I just can't see it. It's because you hadn't been born again. You get in this altar, get full of the Holy Ghost, and you'll wake up to a whole new world. But they that are after the Spirit, mind the things of the Spirit. Let's hurry. It's 403, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. There it is. To be carnally minded is death. This whole world is dying. The only thing that you can be assured of is this in this world is you're going to die. One of these days you're going to die. Then what? That's all everybody on this earth is doing is dying, folks. How many funerals have you been to lately? They're all just dying. Then what? The only thing that offers you hope in life is the church. You know, one of these days you're going to, you're going to bury your parents. It's coming probably sooner than later. Then what? Then what's it going to matter what they were on this earth? What's it going to matter who they were, where they live, what... Everything, the minute they breathe their last breath, everything will lose meaning. It will not matter anymore unless they were full of the Holy Ghost. That's why you should not be ashamed if your parents are not in this church to parade your apostolic lifestyle in front of them and tell them over and over again, it's the only life-giving hope. It's the only life-giving source. Don't let them dumb you down. Stand in the fact that you found the answer. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enemy against, into me against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's why you don't want to line up. That's why you don't want to separate yourself. You can't bring your, without a miracle of the Holy Ghost. You can't bring yourself under submission. And once you get the Holy Ghost, you got to keep killing the flesh. That's what a prayer life's about. you got to keep killing the flesh. So then that they are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9, this is the clincher right here. This is the clincher, folks. 
But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If it so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, if you're not full of the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues, notice I said full of the Holy Ghost, not got the Holy Ghost in 1972 or 82 or 92 or even 2002. If you're not currently full of the tongue-talking Spirit of God that makes you dead to sin, you're none of His. Stand together, lift your hands. Come on, would you lift your hands and worship Him together? Come on. Come on. Come on, would you thank God for His Word? Would you thank God for His Word? Separation is important. Separation is absolutely important and absolutely necessary because here's the thing, folks, I'm done. If you don't separate yourself at the catching away of the church, he will separate you. I'm going to say it one more time. If you don't separate yourself at the catching away of the church, he will separate you.